Hi, and welcome to our REI USA webinar. We're very pleased to have uh, Nate Hare with us for tonight's uh, topic. And uh, again, we thank you for joining us. Uh, these webinars are something we do from REI USA in series. Uh, we've had the past few weeks. We're going to be scheduling some more starting later in the summer. So a little bit of a summer break. Now that people can finally get out and about and travel, uh, we're going to take a little break from these sponsor webinars. But as I was uh, mentioning earlier, REI USA, we are working on a full weekend summit of two full days of eight hours each day, eight separate webinars. The last weekend in July, we'll be getting our members details about that. My name is Dave Cole. I handle the sponsorships and the uh, partnerships for REI USA. It is my pleasure to do that and also to host these great webinars, but uh, I won't bore you with any uh, more details on that or on me, other than, you know, I will mention for tonight's topic that I also uh, do have a self-directed IRA and went through the process, a lot of which Nate is about to talk about, and do have some passive investments uh, that I do because of it. So this is very worthwhile. Be sure to take notes. We'll have time for questions and all that. So be ready. Uh, the topic is lending, borrowing, and buying using self-directed IRAs to fund all your real estate deals. Uh, Nate Hare with New View. And uh, I will let Nate talk a little bit about his background and then just go ahead with the presentation. And again, when you have questions, be sure to write them down or you can put them in the chat box because we are here for those of you that are attending just as well. So Nate, we welcome you in. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Dave. Thank you, REI USA. Uh, love getting on here and sharing this knowledge with you guys or this information. Uh, as Dave kind of mentioned, uh, he's got a self-directed IRA. Um, and that's great. Um, most people don't even know what a self-directed IRA is, uh, we, we find. So this is kind of a passion for me to present on this. I will tell you a little bit about my background as I pull up my slides. Um, let me know if you can or can't see that, I guess. You can see um, it. You're good. Awesome. So I started back in real estate right fresh out of college. Um, I always wanted to be in real estate, didn't know exactly what in real estate. Um, but when I started out back in 2002, I got into lending. I was always good with numbers. It re revolved around real estate. And I spent a lot of years in lending, um, but also buying and holding my own uh, residential real estate. Had actually owned some land too. So I had a pretty good diversified real estate portfolio. Uh, 2008 hit, and that was a, a tough learning lesson. I know a lot of people learned a lot of lessons in that time. Um, but that really triggered something in me to search for better ways to invest uh, my money overall. And it was about 2012 when I came across a company that offered these, quote, self-directed IRAs. And I had never even heard that term before. Most people don't ever hear that term because it's not a uh, widely known type of investment um, opportunity. Most people know about IRAs and they associate IRAs or 401ks with stocks, bonds, mutual funds and CDs. And that's exactly what I had as I had a Northwestern mutual account that I had a SEP IRA and I was putting money in there and I really had no idea what it was invested in. So I was shocked to learn in 2012 that I could use my retirement accounts to invest in the things I was knowledgeable about, which back then and even today is, is lending. Uh, so it, it, it triggered something in me. I, I thought, well, how come the world doesn't know this? This isn't on TV. I've never seen a commercial about a self-directed IRA. I've never heard anybody talk about a self-directed IRA. I really had to dig and find this information out for myself. And now I'm real passionate about sharing, you know, the knowledge that I've gained in my nine, almost 10 years now in self-directed IRAs and how powerful they can become or be for anyone who's investing in not only real estate, but any alternative asset that, that is outside of the traditional stock bond mutual fund uh, or, you know, stock market assets. So um, there's another title that I have for this presentation, which is the self-directed IRA, what it is and why you should have one. And we're going to talk about uh, the tax advantages that you get by owning real estate, um, owning alternative assets in general, uh, the tax advantages you get from the IRAs themselves and specifically self-directed IRAs. 
the types of self-directed IRAs that are out there. Most people don't realize there's seven types of self-directed IRAs that you can use and all the different investment strategies that we see today uh, and what works for certain individuals. So at the end, after I talk about what the self-directed IRAs are, uh, what are the rules you have to abide by? I'm gonna go over two uh, pretty good case studies. One, uh, buying and owning real estate and one, a lending case study that'll kind of encompass all the information that I, that I give you guys in the, in the front end of this. And I encourage you guys to ask questions along the way. I'll probably answer most of them at the end. Um, so I just don't get distracted, but who first, who is Newview Trust Company? I kind of gave you my background. I'll give you a background of the company that I work for. Uh, Newview Trust Company is a custodian. We're based out of Orlando, just north of Orlando and Longwood, Florida. Um, a custodian is, is typically anybody that holds investments on your behalf. And in this case, we're talking about on behalf of your IRA. Uh, most custodians are, that you are familiar with would be a Fidelity, Charles Schwab, Merrill Lynch. Obviously, those are the big names. Those are the guys that hold most of Americans' retirement. About 98% of Americans' retirement is held with those big firms. But those big firms only limit you to what they sell you as far as investments go because they're licensed securities brokers doesn't make them bad guys. I'm just describing the nature of their business is to sell investments. So you can only hold your stocks and bonds and mutual funds with companies like that if that's where you have your IRA. Custodian like Newview, we hold the same types of accounts, the same accounts that you would find in any big bank. The only difference is the assets that we hold within those accounts. We hold what we call alternative assets. And the difference is we don't sell those assets to our clients. So that's why you hear this term self-directed IRA. It's just a marketing term. It's not a type of IRA at all, but self-directed in our world means our client chooses the investment. And our account agreement with our clients simply state, we'll hold anything the IRS allows, but you pick the investment. You tell us what you want to hold in your IRA and we'll act as the custodian for that asset. Um, so we'll go over the different types of accounts and the different types of assets we see. Most of them are real estate uh, based, but just realize that um, IRAs are no different no matter where you go. And I pulled this uh, quote, actually, this is from a Forbes article back in March of 2020, I believe. Um, and it's interesting to know that IRS did a, a study. Um, where they were really trying to dig into these self-directed IRAs. Because again, it's, only, it's a, only a small amount of Americans that use these quote self-directed IRAs. It's growing in popularity, but typically only about 2% of all IRAs are self-directed or hold alternative assets. Okay? These assets like fee simple real estate, land, promissory notes, which we're going to talk a lot about here uh, coming up. But only 2% of all of the IRAs held in America, 2% are self-directed. Yet the IRAs that are valued above $5 million, 25% of the assets hold alternative assets or are self-directed. That jumped out to me like a, like a sore thumb. 25% of the assets held in the $5 million IRAs are alternative assets, yet only 2% of Americans hold alternative assets. That tells you something right there. The rich and the wealthy already understand this concept. Yet most people just don't realize that they have other options for their retirement assets because they're constantly sold investments uh, in mutual funds and things that they really don't understand. So I thought that that was just a really powerful statistic there. Back to what is a self-directed IRA, as a reminder, it's not a type of IRA at all. IRAs are IRAs are IRAs. An IRA at Fidelity is no different than an IRA in New York. In fact, most of our clients at Newview have IRAs with Newview and IRAs with Fidelity. The reason for that is they like to hold some stocks in their retirement portfolio, but they like to diversify and hold some real estate or some promissory note investments or some uh, private equity investments. It's okay to have multiple IRAs. And in fact, I, without giving investment advice, think it's wise to have multiple IRAs with different custodians because that gives you the opportunity to really diversify your asset portfolio. Uh, but remember, self-directed is just a marketing term. The difference is you actually have to choose your investments with a self-directed IRA. So it's not for everybody, but it is for the guy or the gal that is entrepreneurial by nature, or they have a skill set that, that bodes outside of the stock market. This is, again, speaking to real estate investors out there. 
If you understand how to make money in real estate better than you understand how to make money in the stock market, then your retirement should be invested in what you understand. Doesn't mean that there's no risk involved, but it does mean that you'll stub your toe less if you invest in what you know best. So we always say with the self-directed IRA, the best thing about it is you get to pick the investments. The worst thing about it is you get to pick the investments, but you make yourself better returns when you invest in what you know best. And it allows you to save for retirement on your terms. And it gives you much more control and a broader spectrum of investments that you can invest in, such as this. So these are some of the common investment options that we see at NewView, and it goes outside of this. General rule of thumb, the IRS does not tell us what we're allowed to invest in or what we're allowed to hold within our retirement accounts, within our IRAs. There's only two investments that they tell us they, uh, that we're not allowed to hold in an IRA, and that's life insurance contracts and collectibles. Anything else is fair game. So again, most people don't realize this because Fidelity is not going to suggest to you to go buy a rental property in, the, in their IRA because they don't sell rental properties. But as a general rule of thumb, anything you can hold title to, anything you can hold title to, drop a purchase contract for, that purchaser can be your IRA and the title can be held in the name of that IRA. You just have to find a company that's willing to administer those assets on your behalf until you start taking distributions. So what we hold here are alternative assets. Most of them are fee simple real estate, commercial property, land, et cetera. Um, I would say a large portion of our clients like to be passive with their self-directed IRAs. I think Dave kind of mentioned he likes to be passive. I also like to be passive as well. Um, less work, no toilets, no tenants, I like to say. I hold secured promissory notes, just like banks hold secured promissory notes as their initial investment. I like notes payable. I like mailbox money. Um, that My notes payable are owned in, uh, in the name of my IRAs. And I'll talk about the different types of IRAs that I have. Um, but it's all tax-free because the income comes back to my retirement account. So I like the ability to be able to lend out of my IRA, not only because I understand lending, but because it's all tax-free income to me. A lot of clients also uh, use their IRAs to invest in private entities or private stock. Um, this is a two-sided coin, I will tell you, if you're a real estate investor. So if you're talking about your own IRAs, you always want to think, what can I invest in? Uh, you can't invest in, your, invest in your own deals, however, with your own IRAs, and we'll talk about that later in the program. Uh, but you can invest passively into you know, syndications, uh, apartment buildings, uh, commercial property, the list goes on and on. But on the flip side of that, if you are a real estate investor looking to raise private capital for your own investments, then you should understand that IRAs make up or retirement accounts in the U.S. make up $30 trillion and you can borrow from them, but you have to borrow from them through a self-directed account. So the more you can understand about your own self-directed IRA, the better you will be at approaching somebody who may have a retirement account at Fidelity. They might not be happy with their returns. But maybe you as a real estate investor can pay them above average interest secured by real estate by borrowing money out of their retirement account. So it's always two sided. What can you do with your IRA and what can you do with other people's IRAs? And when you have the ability to borrow money, private money from retirement accounts, it doesn't affect your credit. It doesn't really take income or a qualifying criteria. Um, it's really easy to, to do it if you have the relationships and the money is quick. And I'll, I'll talk about that in my own uh, case study at the end about how I loaned $55,000 to a real estate investor. We closed in four days and everybody was happy. So again, these are just some of the alternative assets that we see held in self-directed retirement accounts, um, but it, it, the list doesn't just stop there. So Let's talk about the types of self-directed IRAs. I mentioned there's seven types, and this is if there's any slide you take a picture of on this, uh, besides the case studies, take a picture of this slide. Um, because these are the slide, this is the, uh, the accounts that can be self-directed. When you're looking at this slide, you wanna be thinking to yourself, how many of these can I set up? I wanna set up as many of these as possible because every single one of these on you, that you see here is a tax exempt trust. By definition, these are tax exempt trusts. You're the fiduciary to those trusts. You're supposed to find investments and you take your benefit from the distributions. But the ability to grow wealth is, is much, much easier here because you don't have to pay taxes annually within any of these accounts. 
So traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs are the one most people are familiar with uh, because these are your personal plans. Anybody can have a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA and anybody can make contributions to them as long as they have earned income. There's no age restrict or you don't have to be of a certain age to make contributions to a traditional or Roth. Uh, and most people have traditional or Roth IRAs. Once they maybe worked at a company for X amount of years, you might have started your retirement with a 401k at a job that you worked at. You left that job and that 401k rolled into an IRA. Um, IRAs make up a third of all re uh, retirement accounts in the US. It's the largest source of American retirement. About $10 trillion sits in IRAs. But most people think traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs are the only ones that can be self-directed. And that's actually not true. You can actually self-direct and have your own employer plan. Now this, uh, I got an extra E there by accident. Apologize for that. Um, employer plans, if you're, if you're self-employed, uh, you have the ability to make additional contributions based on your 1099 or Schedule C income to either a SEP IRA, a simple IRA, or even your own solo 401k. Uh, these are great plans if you're looking to stash more money in through your contributions. Contributions are what the money you take out of your pocket and add to your plans each year. Um, you can make very large contributions to your employer plans. So if you look at the personal plans and the employer plans, um, if I'm self-employed, I'm looking at having a Roth IRA and I'm also looking at having either a SEP IRA or a solo 401k. And the reason why I say that is the Roth IRA grows completely tax-free. And I like tax-free because especially with my investment strategy, I do short-term notes, I compound my interest. I, do, I try to do as much as I can to take a small amount of money and make it larger. If I'm gonna take a small amount of money and make it larger, I don't wanna defer my taxes. I wanna eliminate the taxes before I make the profit. So that's what's different between the traditional IRA and Roth IRA. The traditional IRA is typically you put money into it you get a tax deduction for the contribution, but you just defer all the taxes to the future until you start taking distributions. So essentially you pay taxes on your entire retirement. You just don't see it until retirement. And when you start taking distributions, you have to pay that tax back. The Roth IRA works the polar opposite. When you make contributions to a Roth, you don't get a tax deduction, but the trade-off is real sweet. With the Roth IRA, once you've had the Roth IRA open for five years, and you're above the age of 59 and a half, every dollar in your Roth IRA is tax-free and penalty-free for the rest of your life. And even better, when you pass away, when your inheritance or when your beneficiaries inherit that Roth IRA, they get to live tax-free off of the income through a beneficial Roth IRA for at least another 10 years. So if you can think about wealth building, if you could take a small amount of money that you've paid taxes on, and grow it to a massive amount, doesn't matter how big it is, but it's a Roth IRA. Once you've hit five years and you're above 59 and a half, that Roth IRA is tax-free and penalty-free for the rest of your life. You can continue to invest it. You can continue to hold rental property that gain rental income. And every time a renter pays rent to your homes owned in your Roth IRA, you get to take those distributions tax-free and penalty-free till the day you die. And your inheritance does as well. Um, back to the employer plans. I like to use these to make large contributions. For example, the SEP IRA I can take out of my pocket, I can throw $58,000 a year in as a contribution. Um, for all intents and purposes, the SEP IRA works like a traditional IRA, however. So for those of you who are self-employed who have a high amount of income that you, that you that's reportable on your tax return, if you can make a large contribution to your SEP, but you'd rather have it grow like a Roth, you can actually do that through what's called a conversion. Anybody that has a traditional IRA or a SEP IRA nowadays can actually convert some or all of that account, pay the taxes on it and convert it to a Roth. So what a lot of our savvy self-employed investors do if they really like the, the ability to grow tax-free wealth and they're self-employed, they just use that self-employment income to make a large contribution to their SEP and then they immediately convert that contribution to a Roth IRA. It's called a backdoor Roth IRA. And that's a way to get close to $60,000 in a Roth IRA in one year. So it's all about how you plan out your future and, and what you can do with this money. But I, I'm a big fan of the Roth IRA. And oftentimes it's talked about so much in self-directed classes that people think it's the only one that can be self-directed. 
Um, the simple IRA, it's another employer plan. You can make large contributions, not as high as the SEP IRA. And the solo 401k is another plan that you can make large contributions to. These are another class in itself. And if you guys ever want me back to teach a class on that, I can. Uh, but we also have continuing education to go over the differences between those plans. The main point I want to get across is that you can just make large contributions to them and they can be self-directed. And then the other plans that we have that most people don't even think about are the HSA and the ESA. I have both of these plans set up for myself and I have education savings accounts set up for my uh, two nieces. The health savings account can be self-directed just like the other five plans above. But the health savings account is, is probably one of the best accounts that's, that's not uh, or least understood, I would say. With a health savings account first, it's not health insurance. You have to have a special type of health insurance to have one of these HSAs. Uh, it's called a HDHP, High Deductible Health Plan. My suggestion is if you're interested in, in setting one up, call your health insurance provider, ask them if your plan, your health insurance is HSA compatible. And if it is, immediately set up a health savings account and ma max out the contribution. The reason why is because the HSA account works different than any of those other accounts up there. With the HSA, first of all, you can make decent contributions. It's based on who is insured on your insurance policy. For me, it's I'm the only one insured on my policy. So the max contribution I can make to my HSA is $3,600 a year, but it's tax deductible. So just throwing $3,600 in my HSA, I get to write $3,600 off of my income for the year. So I actually contribute to that before I contribute to my Roth, simply because I get the tax deduction. If I'm a family plan, if my health insurance covers me and another person, I can double that contribution. I can contribute $7,200. And again, it's dollar for dollar tax deductible. Now, I can invest that HSA. I can, I can partner it with my other accounts. I actually partner my HSA with my niece's ESAs, which I'll get to in a minute. But I partner all of my accounts, including my Roth IRA, on any loan that I do to a real estate investor. Reason being is when the real estate investor makes interest payments back to my accounts, I've got interest payments that are going back to my Roth IRA, my HSA, and the two ESAs that I have. The difference is those accounts work differently. So the Roth IRA, I want to keep that income in there growing until 59 and a half. The HSA, however, any profit that's earned in the HSA, I can take out tax-free and penalty-free immediately to pay for any out-of-pocket health expenses that I have that my insurance doesn't cover. So that would be things like doctor's visits, uh, co-pays, acupuncture, uh, holistic medicine, uh, dental work, eye, uh, eyeglasses, uh, all sorts of things, prescriptions, I think I mentioned that. There's a whole list of, of things that you can pay uh, as a tax-free, penalty-free distribution from your health savings account instead of dipping in your pocket and paying for those things. The problem is what most people are taught is they're taught to work, pay taxes, and then pay for health expenses. The problem with that is when health expenses increase, you have to work more to pay more taxes to hopefully be left with enough money to pay for your health expenses. If you switch your mindset as an investor and just say, you know what, why don't I just invest this HSA and I can take the earnings out tax-free and penalty-free to pay for my health expenses instead of just using my own money as a taxpayer. Once you start doing that, you realize that you can consume more goods with the same amount of money because you take Uncle Sam out of the equation. So the health savings account, it's tax-free going in, tax-deferred as you invest it, and then tax-free when you take the money out to pay for any qualified health expense. It's not a use it or lose it plan either. A lot of people get it confused with the FSA, the flexible spending account. Uh, the flexible spending account does not work like the HSA. The flexible spending account is the one where you lose the money at the end of the year if you don't use it. So people run out and buy a bunch of stuff they don't need just so they don't lose their money. The HSA stays intact. You can continue to invest it. And even better, you can actually keep making contributions to the HSA and keep investing it and just not take any money out. And here's, here's the thing that's really cool with the HSA. I know I said you could take money out to pay for health expenses, but you can actually defer that distribution and just reimburse yourself for things you pay later in the future. So let me just give you a hypothetical. Let's say that you set up a health savings account and you start making contributions for the next 10 years. You don't take a dime out of it for 10 years. You could see the growth on that 
again, because you leave more capital in there that compounds on itself, the account grows bigger faster. Meantime, in those 10 years, you do pay for the health expenses out of your pocket, but you save all the receipts. Doesn't matter how long you save them for. When you absolutely need the money, you can take a big fat distribution and reimburse yourself for every receipt that you've saved in that drawer. That is pretty cool. And if you guys miss that, basically you can just keep funding your HSA, keep investing it, and then just pay yourself back for everything that you paid for in the periods of time you had the HSA set up and the high deductible health plan. So as long as you have those two things set up, you can reimburse yourself later in the future. And when you're paying yourself back at that point, you can go to Europe on that distribution. You can buy a new car off that distribution. It's really, really cool in how truly flexible it is. And then one more fun fact with the HSA, I love this plan. One time in your life, you can fund your HSA with a tax-free transfer from your traditional IRA or SEP IRA. Whew, I'm pretty sure most people didn't catch that, so I'll repeat that. You can fund your HSA with a transfer from your traditional IRA. The cool thing about that is remember what your traditional IRA, how that works. Most people, that's their emergency bucket. They've got that old rollover IRA from the old job that they worked at. And let's say that you have a health expense, it's $3,000 for a root canal. Well, if I have that knee jerk reaction to take $3,000 out of my traditional IRA, I'm taxed on the $3,000. And if I'm under 59 and a half, I have to pay a 10% early withdrawal penalty. But if I haven't used my one-time transfer yet, you can do it one time in your life, I can just move $3,000 over to my HSA. And then when I take it out of my HSA, because it's being used for a medical expense, my root canal, it's tax-free and penalty-free. So I take it from an account that I can't use until 59 and a half that I'm penalized for taking out too early and moving it to an account that I can use today and I'm not taxed. And I already know what you evil rich people are thinking. How much can I move up to your contribution limit? So it takes the place of your contribution. So use it wisely. I would say in a year, you don't need an additional deduction by making a contribution to the HSA and you wanna just move some money out of your traditional IRA, move up to the contribution limit. So if you've got a family plan HSA, you can move $7,200 from your traditional IRA to your HSA and use it immediately. The education savings account, another great account. And just like the, the name suggests, you can make contributions to it. You can invest it just like you invest all the other plans but the distributions or the, prop, the profit can be taken out tax-free and penalty-free to pay for qualified education expenses for your kids, your grandkids, your nieces, whoever you decide to set that up for. Uh, catches are the, the child has to be under the age of 18 uh, for you to make contributions to the plan. The contributions are relatively small, $2,000 per child per year. So if you've got three children, you'd wanna set up an account for each of them. But here's the cool thing. It works a little different than the 529 plans. 529 plans are usually, were usually used for college savings, but the education savings account or Coverdell education savings account is what they actually call it. You can make contributions as soon as a child has a social security number, you can start making contributions. You can start investing it right away and you can start, take, just start taking distributions to pay for qualified education expenses from pre-K all the way through college. So that would be things like tuition, uniforms, if they're going to private school, if they're not going to private school, any computers, books, tutoring, after school programs, uh, law, uh, vocational schools, if they end up not going to college, but they go to a vocational school. And of course, college expenses are included. So again, as a, as a somebody who has kids or grandkids and, and they've got family that's got health expenses, what a great way to put money into these accounts, invest in the same investments that you would find anyways, but save more of the profit and eliminate the taxes and consume more health expenses and education expenses that you're going to have to pay for anyways. So once I started learning this, I thought they should teach this in high school. <laughs> Why am I learning about this in my 30s and nobody even taught me about any of these? And the fact that all of these plans can be self-directed into promissory notes or real estate. Uh, I mean, the, the investment options is endless and the tax advantages that you get with all these plans is just phenomenal. So my, if, you, if you ask me on a personal level what I think the best, most powerful plans are, I would definitely say the Roth IRA. If you're self-employed, the Roth 401k, which is that solo QRP, one, uh, excuse me, solo, solo QRP, it's got a Roth component to it, the health savings account and the education savings account, because those are all the ones 
that grow completely tax-free and penalty-free if they're used correctly. So hope I didn't bore you guys too much with that stuff, but I, I just think that's fascinating how those accounts give us so much tax benefits. And you really take this information to the next level when you start partnering those accounts together. And I'll tell you, I'll show you how in the last case study that I do, how I partnered eight IRAs together on one promissory note and how that, how that worked out. So, excuse me here, apologize, wrong button. So let's just talk about the restrictions real quick and then I'll go over the case studies. Um, it is important to understand there are some rules um, with IRAs in general that you have to talk about, you gotta to touch on, especially when you talk about self-directed IRAs. Now these are IRA rules in general, Fidelity has the same rules. They just don't ever have to tell you about them because you're only buying and selling investments from Wall Street. So we do have to talk about them in the self-directed world because now the keys are in your hand and you have more investment options. So you do have to understand there are certain investments and certain people that can't be involved in your investments when you self-direct. I mentioned this earlier, the investment restrictions are just the two things that the IRS says you're not allowed to hold. One would be collectibles and the other is life insurance contracts. Collectibles are specifically defined. It's things like works of art, antique rugs, collectible cars. It's really anything that's hard to value. You ever seen uh, that show? I don't know if they still have it. Antique road show uh, where somebody finds a vase in their attic and they bring down and they say, yeah, it's, it's worth $5,000 to $50,000. Well, if the value is subjective or if the value is whatever someone would pay for it, the IRS just doesn't like those types of assets in an IRA, especially in a traditional IRA. If you're trying to calculate taxes on a collectible, it's almost impossible sometimes. So they say no collectibles in an IRA. And life insurance contracts, they just don't like to see people have vested interest to see other people die, right? So that's the only way that I can explain that, but that doesn't get us if we're real estate investors. But just understand those are the two things IRAs cannot hold. The biggest thing that we have to talk about when we talk about self-directed IRAs, however, are the people. There are a list of people that are restricted from engaging in the IRA as an investment with or in the investment or benefiting from the IRA's investment directly or indirectly. The main disqualified person to an IRA is yourself. Your responsibility or your relationship to your IRA is that you're the fiduciary of your IRA. And as a fiduciary, what a fiduciary responsibility is, is you have to act in the best interest of your principal, right? It works no different than if you were the fiduciary of a sick relative because your sick relative was dying and they couldn't you know, do the things that they needed to do, like pay their bills, you know, make sure their electricity is on and things like that. If you were named their fiduciary, your job is to act in the best interest of them when it comes to their money. So the same relationship applies to your IRA. You're the fiduciary of the IRA. You put money in it, but once it's in the IRA, it is owned by the IRA. And your job is to just find the IRA investments, make it grow. And the IRS gives us great tax advantages where they don't tax us as investments grow, but your benefit has to come from the distributions, nothing else. So for example, if I use my IRA to buy a rental property, I can't pocket the rents that are supposed to go to my IRA. I must let the income flow to my IRA and then I can take the distributions from my IRA whenever I choose to. I can pick to choose, I can choose to take distributions early if I need to take it for emergency, but I can't take the profit directly from uh, my IRA. Ha everything has to flow in and out of the IRA. Okay. I also can't self-deal with my IRA, meaning if I own a house personally, I can't put it in my IRA or sell it to my IRA. I represent both people. That'd be a conflict of interest, right? People would strike up pretty fancy deals if they just dealt with themselves all day. But remember, when you're dealing with your IRA, you must find it investments and you must find it investments from non-disqualified people. You can't self-deal with yourself. And there's other people that are equally disqualified as you, the owner. It would be your spouse, any lineal ascendants, so that would be parents, grandparents, all the way up, lineal descendants, which would be kids, grandkids, all the way down, and their spouses, so your kids, grandkids, and their spouses, and any companies, those same people, own, control, manage, or are highly compensated by. So 
IRA owner, spouse, up the line, down the line, their spouses, and any LLCs, any partnerships, any extension of those people is still disqualified. And the reason they disqualify those specific family members is because when you die, that's usually who inherits the IRA as an inherited IRA. So if I pass, my IRA typically, most likely, is going to my spouse or my kids. You usually don't pass wealth sideways to brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, nephews. So those family to the side in the IRA world are not disqualified. Now, that doesn't mean I think it's a good idea to loan money out of your IRA to your brother or your sister. That causes other problems. But just understand the people that are strictly disqualified from your IRA are yourself and those people that I mentioned there. And the things that they're not allowed to do are buy, sell, trade, loan, or extend services with the IRA. The first four are pretty self-explanatory. Extending services are things like this. There's, there's actually no definition for extension of service, but it really comes down to case law and interpretation of the law, and it really comes down to this. Are you using your brain or are you using your brawn? If you're using your brain, you're probably just doing something that a fiduciary would have to do. I find a house that my IRA owns. That's me being a fiduciary. I find the renters that rent that home. That's me being a good fiduciary. I find the contractors that work on that home. That's me being a good fiduciary. But when I become the contractor, when I'm doing my own labor on my IRA owned property, that's me extending a service. Now I'm using my brawn and in the eyes of the IRS, I'm increasing the value of that property without making contributions. So the disqualified people, it's very important that you cannot do investments with those people, but they also have to remain at arm's length from the investment. You just have to hire that work out. And as long as you stay within those rules, you get the great tax advantages that they give us by either growing your investments completely tax deferred or in better cases, completely tax free. So and you don't have to be experts on this. I'm just kind of touching on this. If you ever have a question about a scenario, you can always email me and I'll, I'll have my contact information at the end. But I don't want to spend too much time on that because I really want to talk about all the good stuff you can do with these accounts because it's really tremendous. So first, what are some of the investments that you can, you can have in, in a self-directed IRA? Well, one is obviously real estate. And real estate consists of you know, tax liens, land, commercial property. Real estate options is a great one. Don't have time to talk about that, but I love real estate options as a topic when self-directed IRAs. A foreclosed property, you can take your IRA money and buy it to foreclosures. A little different of a process, uh, but it is an option. Uh, condominium, single family. Lending is something that I like to do. Most of my cohorts uh, like to invest, oh, sorry, not just private entities, but they're actually private entities is a very, very popular investment. Uh, again, this is the two-sided coin. Uh, if you're raising money through syndication, realize there's $30 trillion in IRAs. Most people, that's where most people have their money. Uh, so you can invest your IRA into private entities such as LLCs, other people's LLCs who are not disqualified to you, uh, trust, joint ventures, partnerships. I've done uh, all of these actually in, in my own investment strategies in my IRAs. Um, and then promissory notes is kind of what I mentioned earlier. This is the one that I, I tend to stick with uh, that gets me the best uh, residual income, I would say. Uh, it's less work for me. I would say the one thing with promissory note investments is you do have to have access to deals. You don't have to have the deals yourself, but you have to have a network and access to deals. And this is where REI USA comes into place. If you have the ability to have self-directed IRA set up for yourself, and you've got a group of investors that all have the same, well, if you really think about it, you have a private bank at that point. If everybody is using their self-directed IRAs properly and everybody has good investments, I've seen groups of four or five investors who act as lenders to each other with their IRAs. Because remember, you can't, it's prohibited for you to lend your own IRA to yourself. But if I have an investor that approaches me that has a good investment within REI USA or otherwise, and they're looking for private money, well, then I could use my IRA that's sitting there uninvested and hold a promissory note to them as the borrower and they get to buy property with my retirement money, no use of their credit, no use of their income, and they can fund deals in within 24 to 48 hours. And if they ever have a, a, a or if I ever have a deal that I need funding for, well, maybe I can borrow their IRA money um, when I have a deal. And if there's four or five of us doing that, you basically create your own private financing. So if you think outside of, you know, your own IRA and think about who else has IRAs that I know, 
you can really start thinking like, wow, there's a lot of people that have retirement money. And if I can make them above average returns secured by real estate, I don't have to borrow money from a bank. So there's all different types of ways that you can structure these notes. Um, secure promissory notes is the most common. That's no different than uh, what a bank does when they loan you money to buy a property and they secure it by the property. It's no different in the process of how it works here at Newview. I'll kind of talk about that in the case study. Uh, unsecured notes, if you're a little crazy, uh, that's just a, secure, uh, a note that's not secured by anything, but I do see people do, uh, do, see people do that. Net profit notes, uh, that's pretty common. Net profit notes and convertible notes, you see that often if you're lending to a company. Uh, a lot of people would, might do that with a startup company. Uh, seen an investor loan to a friend who had a medical device company uh, who's through a convertible note where basically he can convert his interest or his uh, principal of the note into shares of the company if the company went public. Again, just creative note strategies and they're using their IRAs to get the tax advantage. Uh, shared appreciation notes, net profit notes, and, and so on. Uh, these are just some of the things that we see here at Newview, but you know the list goes on and on. And here's, the pro here's how the process looks from airplane view, and then I'll get into the case studies. If you wanna start buying rental property in an IRA or start lending money out of, out of an IRA, you have to have, of course, a self-directed IRA. Uh, if you wanna set one up, I've got the email for you to do that. That email actually comes directly to me, uh, but that's info at newviewtrust.com. And I got a little special for you guys where we'll make it uh, cost efficient for you uh, for joining in on us today. Uh, but if you want to own those type of alternative assets, you have to have a, an account with NewView or a self-directed IRA company. So it takes literally 24 hours to get an account set up. You just fill out an application, give us a copy of your ID, and we'll have the account open by the next day. Uh, the next step is funding the account. And there's three different ways you can fund your self-directed IRA. One is just by making a contribution. That's just taking money out of your pocket and adding it to the account. And there are contribution limits each year. It's no different than making a contribution to any IRA anywhere else. Uh, most commonly, what how people fund it is by transferring money from an existing IRA. And you don't have to transfer all of the money from an IRA. You could just transfer a, a portion of it. So oftentimes what we'll see is a client might have an account at Fidelity um, and they have a private equity investment that they want to make for $50,000. So they just transfer $50,000 from their Fidelity IRA to their NewView IRA. And then we process the private equity investment for them. Um, the, the thing you want to use NewView for is to hold alternative assets. We hold other things, but that's really our, our bread and butter. Um, so transfers usually take only a couple business days. We fax a letter, uh, fax a transfer form over to the custodian. They wire the funds over. Really easy, really painless in most cases. And if you are have an old 401k or you've left your job, you have an old 403b or a, a thrift savings plan or a TRS or TSP, those can be rolled over into a self-directed IRA. So first step is open the account. Second step is fund it. Third step is where you come in, and this is where the self and self-directed comes in, is you locate the investment. You tell us what you want to invest in, and we've got an operations department that'll walk you through what's needed to get that investment funded and properly vested in the name of your IRA. The main point I want to make, just to make it real simple, is that you're still doing the legwork no different than you would do the legwork where you're finding your own property or own promissory note investment. The only thing that's different is the name on the contract is gonna be your IRA, not your personal name. That's all that's gonna be different. And once you submit us the contract that has the name of your IRA properly listed there, we sign the contract because we're the IRA administrator. Um, we'll send the funds. We don't hand the funds to you that's sent directly to the title company or to the attorney's office. You're directing us as to what to do, but the money's never touching your hands. And that's how you want it because you don't want it perceived as a, as a distribution. So you locate your investment, you work with our operations department to get us the contracts or the, or the purchase agreements, whatever it may be. And you just fill out a, a, a new view investment form that basically gives us the authority to make the investment on your behalf. And once we have those two items in hand, we fund the investment and we fund within 24 to 48 hours. So it's very, very quick, provided we have all the documents uh, correct. And, and once you do it once, it's like riding a bike. So I'm gonna go over a case study. And as I go through the case study, I'll kind of talk about the process. This is actually a friend of mine. Uh, I really love this um, investment. It, it really, really is powerful. And I will tell you, he's a, a pretty, pretty knowledgeable real estate investor. He had not really paid attention, much attention to his IRAs though. He came to me a couple of times. He said, you know, I haven't really done anything with my IRAs. I haven't even made any contributions, but he was a really good, smart real estate investor. So he had made a contribution, um, small contribution 
to his Roth IRA because he knew he could take this small amount of money. If he, he found a real creative deal, if he made a lot of profit on it, he didn't want to pay taxes. So he used a Roth IRA, not a traditional IRA. And again, this is a very, very important lesson here. And what he did is he actually found three warehouse units. And I'll tell you exactly how he found this. In, in just looking for property for himself, he ran into a motivated seller. This motivated seller was a tired landlord. It was actually a widow. Uh, her husband had passed away recently, and her husband was the one that really took care of these three warehouses that they had. Now, these were pretty run down warehouses, but they did have tenants in each of these three. Once he passed away, she really had no interest in managing these properties. And unfortunately, the uh, tenants realized this and they started pretty much taking advantage of her. They stopped paying rents. They paid rents periodically. And she just she didn't need the money. She just didn't like the headache of dealing with these properties. So she put it on the market for sale for one hundred thousand dollars. Now, when my friend found this lady, he actually found out really what was her what was her gripes? What did she really want? She didn't really want money. And she said, well, she liked the income when they all paid, but she didn't like the headache of trying to track them down and beat them down for payments. So he went back to the drawing board and came back to her and said, if, if I structured a deal where you got the same amount of money that you would get if they had all paid rent every year, every month, but you didn't have to deal with the tenants, is that something that you'd be interested in? She said, oh, most definitely. So what he did is he went back to her and he said, if I structured this in a way where I dealt with the tenants, I made sure that they paid. Okay? He used a property manager to do that. Okay? I'll give you $5,000 as a down payment to put in your pocket. And if you will do this for me and, and actually sell this to me with a carried back note, okay? seller financed it to him. And in this case, sold it to his Roth IRA as the buyer, okay? carried back a note to her at 9% for 10 years. Now, the reason he did that is because this was about the payments that she was getting from these warehouse units. So she was happy. The note payments from him, or in this case, his IRA, are about the same as what she would collect if she got rent from each of the tenants. And the transfer of title read, or the, the new title owner would be New View Trust Company, which is us. FBO stands for for the benefit of his name and his Roth IRA account number. So he bought this property on terms. Reason he did that is because he only had $7,000 in his Roth IRA. So he was able with his small $7,000 Roth IRA buy three warehouse units totaling $100,000 in value because he bought it on terms and he got the seller kind of what they wanted at the beginning. Okay. Now I will tell you, I teach a class. I'm not, I don't have time to go over the details of this, but when you buy property debt leveraged in an IRA, there actually is a tax that kicks in. Your IRA becomes a taxpayer at this point. Um, this tax is something that you don't have to worry about if you structure deals like this, because I'm going to show you how he bypassed this tax, uh, paid a little bit of tax. Uh, and if you go to our YouTube page, I talk a little bit more in depth about this. But the, the more of the story is you can do structure creative deals like this um, and you'll see how this turned out. You'll see uh, that this turned out really, really well, even though his IRA had to pay a small tax because it's a debt leveraged investment. So fast forward in time. Okay, 16 months later, after owning this uh, property, in these three properties in his Roth IRAs, the tenants were now paying on time. He actually had to kick one or two tenants out and get new tenants in there. Uh, and But now that the Roth IRA owns these properties, remember, he's just directing it like a quarterback. All the money is going in and out of his Roth IRA at this point. So the rents that are being paid by the tenants are actually going to New View Trust Company. We deposit those rent payments into his Roth IRA. And then he's taking part of those payments and paying her on the note. Okay, so we're again, all the money's going in and out of side of the Roth IRA, but he found the investment. So this goes on for 16 months. He's got a little bit of cash flow in there. And then he finds a, a buyer for one of the warehouses. He sells off one of the warehouses for $90,000, okay, which goes, all that money goes to his Roth IRA. And that gave him with one more year's contribution gave him enough to pay off the seller finance note to the original owner. So with the sale of one of those warehouse units, he was able to pay off the note, which eliminated the debt finance tax that he had. And his total investment of $7,000 that he had to pay to, to take the property in the name of the IRA, the $5,000 down payment and about $2,000 for closing costs, the total UDFI or the tax that the IRA had to pay because it bought debt leveraged property was only about 9,000. I'm rounding that up 
was about $9,000, okay? And he, after he paid off the note, the two other warehouse units were valued at about $200,000, but there's no debt anymore. So for a $16,000 investment, $7,000 to take it down, $9,000 to pay the UDFI tax, he now owns two warehouse units that are cash flowing over $1,000 a month and valued at $200,000 in a Roth IRA, which if you guys do the math, that's tax-free and penalty-free for the rest of his life. That's the kind of power that you get with these Roth IRAs. Uh, and, and the ability to structure deals like this is just phenomenal. Now, when he becomes 59 and a half and he's had this Roth IRA for five years, that $200,000 Roth IRA is gonna be much, much larger if he keeps on this pace. And if you think about that, the, the taxes that he ended up having to pay on that initial, his initial contributions to the Roth is he only will pay taxes on $7,000 because Roth IRAs are after tax. So you can see the difference in taking small amounts of money and make it larger. Once you eliminate the tax, I mean, it's like heaven at that point. So again, I think that they should teach this in high school personally. Let's look at a, a lending situation. I want to talk about my own uh, self-directed IRA investment, and then I'll wrap it up here. Um, and I'll be real quick because I know I'm running short on time. But this is an investment that I did to a real estate investor, not the actual picture. I can't actually look up the, uh, the try to get look up the appraisal, but my email wouldn't go back that far. This is quite a few years back. Um, but basically, a real estate investor came to me one day, and I knew this real estate investor, so I had a good relationship with him. He said, Nate, I found this deal, but I need funding fast, and the bank won't give me money. I said, okay, what's the deal? He said, I found this deal. Uh, this property was inherited. It's been vacant for two years. You know, one of these properties, grass was overgrown, you know, uh, leaves are all over the place, gutters falling down, uh, and it was in a rough area of town. So nobody was really looking at this property and the bank would not finance a property in this condition that it was in. But he negotiated with the owner who was in, living in another state and just had really no uh, need for this property. He negotiated that he can buy this property for 25,000, there would be a rehab of at least 30,000 he anticipated. And he told me that the ARV was 125,000, which to me as a lender, I thought, okay, I do that deal all day. Well, the reason I have 137 up there is when I ran the comps myself and double checked it with another real estate investor that I knew that knew the area really well, he told me, yeah, 125 is conservative. He goes, I think that could be 137. So right away, I knew this was a good deal for a lender myself or my IRA is to be, to be secured by. So Meaning that he needed this money fast, uh, he was perfectly okay with paying 10% and two points up front. And usually how I do my loans is I do short-term loans. Most uh, uh, self-directed IRA lenders, they don't want to be uh, stuck to you for 30 years. Most of them are in, in, in the short-term uh, lending game, as I am myself. So what I did is I uh, needed $55,000, but I went and got, gathered eight IRAs together. Now on the promissory note, I don't have it here listed for you, but on the promissory note, it literally had Newview Trust Company, FBO, my Roth, Newview Trust Company, FBO, my HSA, Newview Trust Company, FBO, my niece is ESA, and I have another niece that has an ESA. So four accounts were mine. Four accounts were other people that I approached that had their money uninvested that wanted to be part of the deal. So all that's really painful on there is just getting all the IRAs listed on the promissory note, but they are all in first lien position. It's just a fractionalized note. It's no different than having one IRA. You're just listing eight IRAs and they all have pro rata interest on this note. The good easy thing for the borrower is that they just had to make one interest payment to Newview and Newview split those checks up eight ways every single month that he paid. Uh, we did a one-year balloon with optional extension. I, I always put an optional extension just in case the borrower is paying on time and he just needs a little bit more time to you know, do what he needs. If it's making me 10%, more power to him, keep paying. Uh, but I don't want to go too long you know, in, in an investment. And he doesn't want to go too long paying 10%, but he needed the money because he needed private money and he needed to buy this fast. So um, another thing that I do in my loans is that there's, there's new view fees that are obviously, we got to keep the lights on. They're usually a couple hundred bucks a year on a, on a deal like this. Um, but the new view fees, the, my administration fees for my IRA and any legal fees, I always pass that on to the borrower because they have to pay fees when they go to a bank. So, and I don't want to pay fees for lending them my money. And he's more than happy to pay the legal fees. Uh, so, it, and it's a lot less money than going to a traditional bank and a lot faster. So we closed this deal in four days. Um, and after one year, the borrower just refinanced our loan with conventional financing and he kept it as a rental property. 
which gives me my money back. And I have the ability to redeploy that money after one year with all the interest. So I get to compound my interest. Um, and if you, if you believe in Einstein, uh, Einstein says the eighth wonder of the world is compound interest. Uh, those who understand it, earn it. Those who don't pay it. Uh, and here's just, I just want to grab something and just so you understand the power in compounding. And, and I really like this because you can really grow your IRA exponentially in a tax-free manner if you can understand how to compound and if you can understand how to do it tax-free. This is just a chart that I grabbed uh, online, which just shows you the power of compounding and the effect of taxes. This is if you took a dollar and doubled it 20 times. If you put a dollar in an account and then put a $2 in the account the next year and another dollar and another dollar and another dollar. If you eliminated the taxes, look at the difference that the, that bucket of money uh, is uh, by just removing taxes and we'll assume at 25%. Compounding a dollar, uh, doubling it 20 times without paying taxes, a million $48,000. And simply by having taxes taken out of that amount every year, $72,000. This is why so many people have a hard time retiring, I think, is because uh, most people just don't understand the, the ability to grow tax-free dollars of money. It's completely legal. It's just that we don't get this information in school to talk about all these accounts that grow completely tax-free. And truthfully, I think that they probably don't want us to all know about it because uh, we'd all be billionaires at that point. So um, I hope this information was helpful. Um, it's a lot to go over, I know, in an hour, uh, but we do have a lot of education that we post on a weekly basis. Um, if you follow us on YouTube, uh, New View Trust, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We post our live classes every single week on that channel. If you follow us on Facebook, you'll also get live notifications. We actually teach a live class where you can ask questions every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you want to go to our website, our website's New View Trust. Dot com. So you can stay updated, you can stay in tune, and we always do different topics. I've got about, I don't know, 30 different topics that we talk about, and I have guest speakers on. So it's real fun, and, and the, uh, the information is fresh every single week. Um, if you want to work with NewView, if you're looking at other self-directed IRA companies, I've worked with a few in, in my years, my nine years in the industry, I will tell you NewView, as far as value, is, is probably at the top. Uh, we were actually voted top five self-directed IRA companies in America in 2020, but when it comes to uh, fees, we are the most affordable when it comes to uh, doing your transaction. So this is just kind of a breakdown of new view trust fees compared to other self-directed IRA fees. And I've done my own calculations, especially if you have larger accounts, you save 20% uh, is actually conservative. Uh, most uh, not comparisons that I've done, new view fees save you about 33% as far as administration fees go. So very, very cost effective. Uh, and we've been in this business for over 17 years. So we're not a new kid on the block. We're actually one of the veterans when it comes to self-directed IRA administration and education. Uh, and here's the promo that I wanted to give everybody. If you want to open an account by the end of the month with no application cost, um, just email us at info at newviewtrust.com and I'll have one of my IRA specialists reach out to you, answer any questions, walk you through the application. Or if you just know what you want to do and you just want to get started, just make sure to put a promo code June 21 on the application. You'll see a, a, a little box for promo code uh, that'll ensure that we do not charge you an application cost. Um, so you can save up to $50 for every account you decide to open. So I would encourage people to, you know, look at opening Roth IRAs for yourself, for your spouse, for your kids, if they have earned income, HSAs, ESAs. I, I hope that I got the point across on how powerful those accounts can be. And when you apply your knowledge as a real estate investor or a lender, uh, you can grow huge amounts of tax-free dollars in a completely legal way and really set up your family uh, for, with generational wealth by not only uh, giving them accounts that, that turn into inherited IRAs growing tax-free, but also showing them how you're doing it on their own. Um, and, and if you show them at an early age, you're, that's the greatest gift you can give to your next generation, I think is the gift of tax-free wealth. So um, I hope that helped. I know I kind of ran kind of long, but if um, there's any questions, I'll kind of turn it back over to Dave. Dave, if you're still there. Oh, yeah, most definitely, Nate, and thank okay. you for such a great presentation. Uh, we do have a couple of questions here. So actually, we had three, and one of them you answered during, but our members okay. always ask some good questions. And this is one I can relate to. The question deals with using a self-directed IRA, 
does it matter if you purchase a property out of state? And I will just comment that uh, you can certainly do that because this is subject to IRS guidelines, which is federal and not state. And because it's a passive investment, um, you know, you can do that. But uh, you're the pro, Nate. So if you want to kind of address that a little bit as far as advantages of being able to use the self-directed IRA to purchase out of state because it's passive. Yeah, I'll even expand on that. It doesn't even stop with our borders. You can invest your IRA out of the country. Uh, it, it, there's no limit as to where you buy property. I will tell you different countries have different uh, buying processes, but we have new view clients that buy property in Belize, buy property uh, you know, in, uh, all over the world, really. Um, so yeah, anywhere in the country, most definitely, you can even go outside of the country. But in that case, Nate, and I know Belize has very good tax incentives, but mm -hmm. would you be subject to any international tax situations because it might not be covered through the IRS, or I didn't quite ask that right, but uh, mm -hmm. would you not be you know, subject to tax consequences from other countries in that scenario? Or is this a self-directed IRA also protected for that? That's yeah. better. Way yeah, the, the IRAs all have the same type of protection when it comes to the growth within the IRA. The only thing that you got to consider is if you take distributions and you're a taxpayer, obviously, um, you know, different taxes may hit you as an individual. So I'll break it down more, you know, to, to people in the country. You know, if you have a traditional IRA and you're in a uh, state that's got, you know, state tax and, and, and things like that, you might get hit with those taxes as an individual as you take distributions. Um, and the same applies when you're out of state. So you can still grow the, the uh, assets within the account completely tax deferred or tax free. But when you take the distributions, depending on what tax situation you are as an individual, then there might be other taxes that kick in. Okay, thank you. And Dana, who's attending, is now asked a second question. Uh, let me give those both to you. A few minutes ago, she asked, is there a minimum amount that one can transfer to the self-directed IRA? And then a couple minutes ago, she asked, uh, the asset fee is applied when using on purchasing real estate property. In other words, from your price list, she was asking if the asset mm -hmm. fee is applied upon purchasing. And mm -hmm. uh, those, so those are her two questions. She also wants to know if uh, we would have access to the presentation deck. So if you are willing to do that, you can even email it to me and we'll, uh, we can put that out as well. Or um, yeah, or you'll give your contact information so we can have Dana and anybody else. Let's do that. Let's have them go directly to you so then you can answer more specific questions from them. But anyway, the, sure, yeah. the one on the minimum amount and then the asset mm -hmm. fee and where that comes yep. into play. Yeah, so there's no minimum amount. You can transfer as much as you want. And, and what I often tell people is um, open a self-directed IRA is, is step one, and we don't have account minimum. So you would at least want to get that account established. And since we don't charge it, an application fee, it doesn't really cost you anything to do that. Um, and then when it comes to moving money over, depending on what you're investing in, um, I would urge people not to send a bunch of money to NewView and have it sit like a rock. And I will just tell you that straightforward. That's what I would do if I was opening an account. But if you're going to invest in real estate, for example, transfer enough for us to uh, cover an earnest money deposit in the event that you run into a property you want to buy. That way we have the account set up. You've got the proper vesting. You've got your account number. You know what to put on the purchase contract. And then when we have enough to make the earnest money or option fee, we can send that directly from the IRA. And then you can move the rest of the money over, transfer the rest uh, from Fidelity or whatnot. So there's no limit on how much um, you transfer over and you can plan it out a little bit too, especially on transfers since they're so quick and they're not reported to the IRS, you can transfer as much or as little as you want anytime. Um, and then getting back to the fees question, that's a great uh, question on the fees. On the transaction fees, we have four different options how you pay the transaction fees. Um, first, there's transaction fees when you buy it. It's only $95 to purchase an asset. That's charged at the time that you buy it. And then the recurring administration fee, uh, depending on the plan that you're on, it may be charged at the time you purchase it, or it may be charged quarterly in arrears. Uh, we have different options that, that basically you can choose to, uh, and, and make it the most cost efficient for yourself. And any of those fees that I'm mentioning too, you can pay those on a credit card. One of the only things you can pay for your IRAs, you can't pay for 
assets or fees related to the asset, but you can pay for your administration fees related to the IRA. So when you fill out an application, what I always suggest to people is choose a credit card as your billing method. Meaning when we do, when you do a transaction, it just charges your card. And most real estate investors or people who are self-employed just write those expenses off as a business expense. I'm not a CPA, check with your CPA, but I know a lot of people like to charge it to their credit card so they can write it off, put points on their card. And that prevents money coming out of their IRA that's tax-free just to go for fees. So keep the money in the IRA, pay it by credit card, and you, you have a couple different options as how you pay it to make it more cost-effective for you. And then the uh, third question I believe was the slide deck. I can do either one. If anybody wants the slide deck uh, you know, right away, just email me at info at newviewtrust.com. And I'll shoot you over the slide deck if you want to have it. No problem. Okay, real good. And also, we will be uh, putting this webinar up on our uh, sponsor webinar uh, page, the replay of it. So uh, that will be available to REI USA members as well. Nate Hare, we thank you so much for uh, presenting this tonight. Some great information. And uh, again, we thank you on behalf of REI USA. So let us wrap that up. Hope it's been great for everybody. And uh, please do follow up with Nate. And uh, that is it. Have a good night and thank you for your attendance. Thanks, Dave. Thanks everybody for uh, attending. You bet.